The story that comes to us from Los Angeles involves uh, what many of us believe was a uh, false flag operation at a building called the Los Angeles Times. It was an explosion and a tragedy not unlike what we just saw that happened in Washington Square in New York. And uh, I want to mention that we want to thank everyone from Los Angeles who participated tonight and it is our, our dream anyway to go to Labor Fest in Los Angeles next year. There are some people there who are starting to put something together. So this, is, uh, this program is dedicated to those people in Los Angeles. And uh, we, to basically set the scene, Los Angeles and San Francisco in 1910, at the time of these events, were uh, quite, quite opposite communities. And in many ways, San Francisco attracted an, uh, a large population from the major East Coast cities of the North. Los Angeles attracted people who came from the Midwest or the South. And so the demographic was much different. Los Angeles was undeveloped at the time. And uh, we were much further along, even with the earthquake happening in 1906, we had this tremendous surge of energy and activity. In many ways, the earthquake was a benefit. And any of you came on our Labor Fest walk of downtown and the history of downtown, you, you heard us talk about what happened when everything was cleared out so the new city could emerge. And during that time, there was a, uh, a lot of innovation going on, from uh, especially due to someone named Otis, uh, a man named Otis who was working on using shipyard rigging and manufacturing rigging and equipment to develop elevators that were safe and efficient so that all of a sudden instead of having very large buildings, uh, four or five stories, very heavy masonry buildings, now we could have these big high towers made of steel. And steel was a new product that was being developed in mills all over the country and in Europe and different shapes were being made and we had a tremendous steel uh, production facility right, right less than a mile from here. And uh, all of these things contributed to a need for an adjustment in how our unions were structured. And, uh, and many of you may know a friend called uh, Bill Fletcher. Bill has a book called Solidarity Divided. And when you go to the very first page in Bill's book, he talks about the challenge all of us face when we deal with change. Uh, Bill was at an, uh, a conference in Africa someone raised the question, what is, the, what is a union supposed to do? What is a trade union? And someone from California got up and said, a union is supposed to represent its members and uh, perform the contracts that, it's, uh, that it assumes and make sure that its members uh, have the best benefits they can achieve. And then he sat down. And uh, so after that, someone from Africa stood up and said that the purpose of a union is to defend and pro promote the interests of the working class and pro talked about social justice. And somewhere in that dichotomy, in that symbiosis, is where we all exist. Unions are big and bureaucratic institutions, but we are individuals and our actions have to be guided by which direction we are going to go. Are we going to wear the uniform of, of a conqueror and go into Vietnam and napalm people? Or are we going to do everything we can to shut the war down? I mean, these are the kinds of things we dealt with in major society, but we have to translate that back into the labor movement to make it meaningful if this labor movement is ever going to emerge again and be an important force in our society. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about heroes, two very great heroes called, one is Job Harriman, a man who could have been president. He's an astounding man of incredible uh, ethics. And Job Harriman was about to be elected mayor of uh, Los Angeles in uh, December 4th of 1910, until these events occurred. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a man named John J. McNamara, who was a, in the spirit of Peter's uh, Legends of Irish Labor. This is the greatest example I can give you of the, the perfect trade unionist. Uh, John J. McNamara was a um, subject of a film called A Martyr to His Cause, which was the very first labor media film that uh, ever developed. He was a, someone who had support throughout the country. He was falsely charged and in the end um, betrayed by his attorneys and by liberals and social, so-called social justice activists. Um, and I'm also going to talk to you about people who are halfway there, people who didn't fit Bill Fletcher's model of being 
for the working class or for their union. They were stood in the middle, like so many of us end up doing, because it's easy. We can tell ourselves we did the right thing, but at the same time, we're not doing the right thing. And these are two very powerful leaders from here. Olaf Tvaimo, who was head of the San Francisco Building Trades, who was a fierce uh, proponent of uh, labor rights. At the same time, he was president of the exclusion uh, mobs, which uh, promoted racism against uh, people who weren't white. And he was supported by a guy named Johansson. But, um, and then people who are inside, and we're going to talk about the story of what the manufacturers and what the, the, uh, the employer sector did to uh, infiltrate trade unions with spies, with uh, people who promoted bombings and, and other things to set up and create the agenda that promoted their cause and deprived us of justice. Uh, be before though, I, I, I like to give people images so this isn't all just a bunch of blank words. So I do have some slides and I'll just take me a minute to get them up. So you can see, I'm going to show you what Los Angeles was like in 1910. And then I'm going to show you some uh, scenes of the events that occurred on October 1st of 1910 when the Los Angeles uh, Times building exploded and collapsed. Uh, very developed infrastructure on this peninsula. But San Francisco was facing, of course, we didn't have bridges then, we didn't have BART, we had a lot of challenges looking at the future. But you can see these from these pictures how poorly developed Los Angeles was, how poorly populated it was. So we're just going to stream through, I have about 20 slides here. This just gives you an example of what was a typical uh, right almost within three miles of what now is downtown LA. And you can see there's really nothing there. They didn't have the central water project uh, coming in. They didn't have any real population there. So if we go to the next one, uh, yeah, you just click that arrow on the next big slide. Where's the first one at? Did you think? That was about three miles from what is now downtown LA. And this is about 1910 in the summer. Uh, here again, you can see this is the San Gabriel. This is going out toward Pasadena. And this is when they were first bringing. Uh, oh, close. Even. This is the uh, one out toward Pasadena. And you can see there's just nothing there. And if I didn't show you these pictures, it would be hard for you to understand LA in the context of this story. So, next slide. Here's some guys who came out. These were uh, miners who were entirely uh, non-union. The United Mine Workers didn't have, these were working on the irrigation system. And the rail that you see in there was going into a tunnel. And uh, contrary to our system, the Hetch Hetchy, when we were developing that, we had a much more progressive labor situation than they had. But uh, this is just an example of what these guys had. You see very little equipment around them. Contrary to here, where we had the best of equipment, these guys did a lot of this work by hand. So the next slide. Uh, this is a, the <coughs> big shots driving around, showing off. The people gathered around from the town. But you can see in the background, nothing is nothing. <coughs> And um, the sequence of these is loaded by the computer, so I'm just, I'm not trying to tell you, use these. I'm just trying to give you some background. So go to the next slide. Um, this is the beginning of what made Los Angeles the power that it was when water got there. Because that allowed them to bring a population. That was an aqueduct? What? That was an aqueduct? Yeah. Sure? That was the beginning of the, the, the Central Valley Project. <laughs> the public. This, you can see this tunnel these guys are working on, the absence of shoring. You can see the tools in their hand. This, this was work that they literally carved out by hand. And uh, it looked by the looks of this, these are guys who showed up from the South, which was devastated by various scenes of economic failures and crop failures. And, but anyway, this is um, this is the, a big airport that developed. And I'm not sure why this picture, oh, I have this here. That's a little bit out of context. But this, again, was just. Uh, to try to give you a visual image of LA. Uh, next one. This was um, an anarchist. Uh, there was some semblance of anarchism, and, and um, the anarchism and the, the activism that was there was in the absence of trade unionism. Here we had a strong union structure of all kinds, uh, many, too many unions in some cases, but there was always organization. So anarchism was a struggle to implement here because we didn't have the audience for to receive it. But in LA, they had no organization to match what we had. 
So this was an attempt by anarchists to go down and uh, promote their agenda. I was the last published on Dolores Street by Emma Goldman and Alexander Burton. Maybe, but it was more popular down there than it, it was, was circulated. Burton's uh, publication. What? That was Alexander Burton's publication. All right. Uh, this was the first beginnings of uh, strikes in LA. And you can see how uh, jubilant these guys are to have some power, some collective power for the first time. Uh, this is just an image that uh, some artists developed. Uh, builders and laborers in the Bay Area, we didn't call them builders or laborers, we called them carpenters or pipe fitters, or they had a union and a skilled craft. But down there without a union, they were just called builders or laborers. That was their uh, uh, here is a civil uh, public workers uh, picture of some early uh, firefighters, locals down there, Los Angeles County Fire Department. And uh, so uh, I work in a union shop, I toil in an open shop. So this is again one of the early organizing symbols that was uh, put out when, the, when union people first went down there and they met uh, fierce resistance. Uh, so here's some more artwork from down there. And um, the next one, uh, this is a scene from one of the struggles that was on the, on the job. I'm not sure the exact time, and the exact year of this one. And this is, uh, we got from UCLA. So in this picture we have Eugene Debs and some of the other candidates from uh, Socialist Party, which was running a national campaign and also had a, a very strong uh, appeal in Los Angeles because the conditions were so bad. And uh, as again, in 1910, we were fully expecting Joe Harriman, who was the vice president, uh, vice presidential candidate of Eugene Debs on the Socialist National Party ticket in the national elections. We expected Joe Harriman to be elected mayor. Um, again, this is just another another scene. So uh, here's some women working with again no tools and obviously they're not dressed for working. But uh, just we're just trying to give you a picture of what LA was. Uh, this was a, a religious colony that was down there. But the, the idea I'm trying to show you is when we hear about our labor history of the Bay Area, it's much more developed and organized, especially as of 1910. And this is a picture of the black uh, African American community in Watts. And uh, they're kind of. What? What year? What year? I'm not sure exactly what year. This is just the period before the war, the period of the time we're talking about, between 1905 and 1920. So that's, that's what our intention is to try to talk about here. I went back to the first one. So, in the context of, of our events of that time, in the Bay Area, we had very strong industrial and craft unions across the board. They didn't have that there. And in uh, 1905, a number of events led to uh, uh, an open shop, a declared open shop movement across the board. Uh, the group of people in Los Angeles formed the Merchants and uh, Manufacturers Association, which had extremely amount of money and resources available to them. And they, um, basically went out and intentionally broke every strike that was um, emerging. Any employer who will, was willingly negotiating with a, uh, his own employers, employees and in recognizing a union, that same employer was denied contracts, was denied credit, and was denied um, and suffered greatly economically by pressure from the other businesses. And uh, these people had politicians, and they, they just had great power. And they were determined to destroy <coughs> unionism and establish an open shop United States. Not unlike what Reagan, not unlike what Reagan and, uh, right. That, that's the reason why this is an important story. Because these events that happened are not unlike the World Trade Center. And these events were false flag events that critically turned the history of California, as we'll get into now. So, <coughs> regard, regarding the union I belong to, iron workers, typically they were, um, when steel was emerging and high-rise buildings were being considered, uh, there was no craft available to do that. There was no existing craft that had come over from Europe and was ready to take on that work. 
So this had to be developed as the industry, as the industry's needs um, achieve that. The first high-rise buildings were done by people who were carpenters. Here in San Francisco, we had a very strong union called Iron Molders, who worked in the shipyards down here, but they were fabricators. They didn't go outside and put buildings up. They made the parts, but they weren't the ones who went out. And as we developed bridges all across the country, we started to see a need for people to go to remote locations and work for a very long time uh, without their family being close by. They had to stay on the job and until we had Mr. Strauss and a few others come here with safety in their minds. Bridge work was very, uh, very dangerous and very difficult. And it was not considered skilled labor as compared to a plumber who had to go to apprenticeship for four or five years or, uh, or a carpenter who had to study a lot of different things to get journeyman level. Um, it took iron workers a long time to earn that uh, credibility. Uh, climbing up a column, walking across a beam, driving rivets all day, not considered as, as uh, skilled as laying out a truss or hanging doors or something carpenters were doing. And uh, so as our union uh, started to look, at, started to emerge, it was a push-pull kind of relationship. The push came from the demand for people to put these high buildings up and build bridges, and the pull came from the basic need for a steady uh, craft identity, because without that we couldn't sustain any kind of membership or anything. So in 1896, delegates from Boston, Chicago, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and New York City met in Pittsburgh and formed this union that we call International Association of Bridge Structural and Ornamental Iron. And the union um, immediately looked on the opposite side and saw the employers also highly um, struggling to catch up to the demands of technology and the demands of the market to put these high buildings up. And uh, many, as I say, when you came on our walk, if you, any of you did, up downtown, when you, we walked up and down Market Street and, uh, and we showed you those, those buildings that were built at that time, as fast as you could mobilize people, there was a need, there was a, a need to get those things going. So the, employer, the, the, the employers were existing, a lot of small shops, family shops, blacksmith shops, people who were poorly financed to, and equipped to handle this. So gradually they started to merge together. And one big erection company came out of all of this called American Bridge Company. And American Bridge um, is still here. They're right here on the east side of Uruguay Island right now. But they're a very famous and very important company. And they were not unfriendly to unions. Uh, they were not really uh, adverse to meeting with our union and signing national agreements. But the one problem that developed with American Bridge was they did not have fabrication resources. They you put up things, but they didn't make the steel, and they weren't the ones who building owners would contract with to get the work. So American Bridge um, was able to do some things, and in 1902 they signed a national agreement with our union, but after a few years, the U our national, international union had great trouble with locals and, and um, many of the decisions made were not the best decisions, but nevertheless, a lot of the locals refused to go along with this national agreement and they pushed the employer in the other direction. American Bridge became the leader of what was called an open shop movement. So um, all of these things came to a head in 1910 at a building in downtown Los Angeles. Okay, now we're going to tell you the people who you're going to hear about, the story of these villains and heroes. And uh, the first one I'm going to show you as we go across here is a dedicated union leader who ended up being president of our International Iron Workers Union at the turn of the century. He was from Buffalo. He admitted to everybody, I don't have a clue what I'm doing, but I'm here to give my best and try to make the best of every day. So. We felt really proud of his effort, and he was uh, not a corrupt individual. He never took a bribe or did anything wrong. He tried to learn how to deal with what was coming. So we'll click here on the next picture. In this one, we see someone who we're going to not be proud of at the end of the evening, Clarence Darrow. We were very proud of him in Idaho when he went up to defend Bill, Big Bill Haywood um, and the murder of the governor of Idaho. But um, in this story, Clarence Darrow was, is not someone you're going to like it when I get finished talking to you. So, this is a great, great Californian. 
And again, I can't say enough about him, Joe Perriman. The next picture gives you a better picture of him. A man of complete integrity. And I'm going to be able to tell you in, a little, in about a half hour of a decision he made that was something that we all need to be inspired by. Uh, again, this is Joe Perriman. And um, this is another book that we have. I have found a number of ancient, or uh, how do you say this, uh, out of print books. Uh, these are available. I have them on disc here. I can give you. They're, they're free. And uh, they tell the story in real time of these events. So um, this is uh, Anton Johansson. He was a, a, an important figure in the Dynamite Inquiry because he was from San Francisco. And he helped uh, this guy, Olaf Tveitmil, who was from the building trades here, send support all over the country for, um, in the war, the class war that was going on at the time. And I'm going to talk about the, how this worked in a few minutes. Uh, again, this was another individual who helped them with that. Bert Franklin was his name. And he was um, one of the, the labor uh, soldiers, I guess we would call them. Uh, this is someone who was the arch, arch enemy of the story. His name is William Burns. You heard of the Burns Detective Agency, perhaps? This is him. He founded it. And Burns was the guy who sold his soul to whoever would pay the most. And Burns uh, was not a police officer. He, was not, he did not work for the FBI. He had no jurisdiction or no right to go around arresting people. He had no right to set bombs in places to implicate others in crimes they didn't commit. But we're going to tell you all about Burns here uh, tonight. This is just a symbol I have in there to show what we were up against at the time. The pressure of the market to produce and convert these steel structures. Now, of course, we didn't have cranes in those. We didn't use the old Guy Derricks. But um, this book here, I also have, you can see it was sold for 15 cents in those days. It's about 300 pages. But it's full of stories. Very well written, believe, believe it or not. I mean, people in those days could write really well. And this is about how um, big business would create uh, scenarios like the World Trade Center where someone, uh, a, 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 a terrible catastrophe occurs and it's always blamed on Union people or blamed on, on whoever wants to be the villain at the time for the great benefit of the enemy. So um, this is... Uh, There's Joe. Yeah. And again, he was all for himself. And uh, he was reluctant to come into this, but uh, I'll tell you why. I mean, this is the building, and uh, we're going to show you. We have about six slides, because if you really need to know this building for this story to make sense to you. The uh, LA Times building? The LA Times building downtown. Uh, in this picture here, we have the two principal brothers. John J. McNamara, who is the hero of our story. This was the martyr to his cause. On the opposite, on the left, is his brother, James B. He was a printer. He was not an iron worker. He was. A, he was. John Jay was an incredibly. Um, um, his integrity was superior, and uh, he was. His brother was a carouser. He was not a family guy. He was uh, never had a steady job, and he fell into this business of following uh, struggles around the country and trying to get paid for it. But I can't find any positive thing he ever did. Uh, again, this is a picture of the layout from those times of the, of the building downtown of Los Angeles. Here we see Burns again, and um, the attorney again, and um, we can just move through these. This gives you a, a scene of the building before the, the, uh, the explosion, and uh, we're almost done here. This shows you the condi working conditions inside. Um, some of these pictures were hard to find, but I wanted you to be able to see what it was like to work in there. Uh, the, the building was owned by a guy named Harrison Otis. Uh, okay, so here we see the night of the bombing and what happened. And um, okay, and then here we have the McNamara brothers and um, one of their friends in that, in that picture. So, and again, this is just some more pictures from the time. So. What was the role of Tom Mooney? Isn't there a Tom Mooney? Tom Mooney is a different story. That was here. Oh, okay. So we can get into that in a minute, because that was quite similar to this story. But it was about uh, six years later. In San Francisco. Okay, so I think, uh, I think we've seen enough of this. So I want to just give you uh, some background on this.
And, and before I do, I want to tell you that um, to prove Bill Fletcher's uh, comments that I opened the story with when Bill said it's a trade union is support its members or support the working class. Well, in this, in this particular story, our union is going to be, I'm going to show you how they did support the overall uh, movement and not their own self-interest. This book of truth about these events is what I'm using as a reference. So when I have my own opinions, I'm going to keep them to myself because for the credibility of this event, I want you to know that um, I'm, I'm using the source. This is published by the District Council of California Iron Workers about 1995, but it tells the story in great depth of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Los Angeles, again, was the most militant open shop anti-union environment of any of the major metropolitan areas, and it presented a great challenge to us in the Bay Area, to our people in the Bay Area, because we couldn't really go forward if our working conditions, uh, which were uh, 20% higher wages, 30% fewer working hours. We had full union recognition. We had basically the eight hour day. They had none of that. And if we didn't um, change what was going on in Los Angeles, the emerging market that was coming up was gonna take away what we had here. Business would just ship there and uh, go south, which is, we're seeing that more and more today. But this was a challenge for everyone in, the, in San Francisco, as highly evolved and as highly uh, organized as we were here, uh, they were the opposite. Uh, they had a very powerful merchant and manufacturers association organized uh, with unlimited funding to um, attack the idea of a closed shop. And um, so in uh, June 1st, to combat of 1910, the metal trades uh, had witnessed the collapse of all other industries uh, trying to organize against this anti-union open shop force and uh, the metal trades were considered we are going to be the final straw we're going to win this or lose but we are going to be the ones who are going to make labor's greatest fight in uh, challenging this so in uh, june 1st 1910 metal trades called for an, uh, a, a general strike a, a strike within their industry of all metal trades people in manufacturing plants and also on outside erection jobs. And they asked, you know what they asked for? An eight hour day, that was it. And they asked for union recognition and something called a living wage. That's it, that, that's all they asked for. These were things we had taken for granted here, but those were their demands. And the employers uh, incredibly furious at this act of uh, of uh, anti-patriotism or whatever, uh, the, the, slave, the slave rising up against the master. The employers were furious, so they immediately shipped in from all over the country armies of non-union people and uh, housed them very well. And they also employed a, a very aggressive force of private detectives to infiltrate any type of organizing effort. They also employed and trained people to falsely impersonate labor organizers. They also trained and employed people from, they hired out of the anarchist movement and people who had skills to, in sabotage to create um, a number of false uh, incidents that embarrassed and, and gave the other side great reason to get great publicity against working people. And in spite of that, the, uh, they could not stop the militancy of the metal trades. So on July 16th, the LA City Council passed an anti-picketing um, law. Anyone who was picketing was immediately thrown into jail. And there were no charges brought for a long time. They delayed, they purposely made the process of arraignment and indictment and arraignment and so forth uh, go to the, the longest uh, possible uh, time period. Uh, when fights would break out on job sites between non-union scabs and, and the union people trying to pick it and promote their organizing, uh, none of those people representing the employer were arrested. It was only uh, what we would say is our people were uh, taken into custody and, and dumped in there. Were the lobbies involved in, in, in these efforts? Well, these were uh, union 
organizations trying to, these were people who were in organized shops already. So I think when we talk about Wobblies, we're talking about the great mass of people who were maybe not necessarily employed yet. What these people were trying to do was win a contract. They were trying to win an eight hour day and union recognition. The Wobblies had a different agenda. And so that was just not, I, I don't really, this story, the Wobblies, actually the people who had Wobbly backgrounds appear in a negative context as individuals, not as a group, but uh, anyway, uh, now when we hear uh, bad stories like I just recounted, there's always a good side, right? I mean, the way the world balances. San Francisco people were watching this very closely, and San Francisco organized tremendous support, just like San Francisco has done for Madison, Wisconsin. And San Francisco sent calls out all over the country for money, they sent lawyers down to LA, they sent food, they did everything they could to try to make sure that um, the spirits weren't broken and that the people down there facing this, uh, this big dynasty, this big monster, were not going to lose, um, lose hope. And at that time, this support had a huge psychological impact, just as the people in Madison will tell you how important it is for them to see uh, everything Steve's done for them and other people here. Um, this is the same thing that happened in those days. So, Joe Harriman's ratings, he was running on a social justice labor ticket. His prospects of being elected in the, de in the December uh, mayoral race were going up. And this friend of, of the uh, Merchant and Manufacturing Association, this lackey of theirs, was, was going to lose. So um, what was really challenging to the other side was they could see that all of their efforts, their goon squad efforts, were backfiring on them. And what they really needed was a single moment to galvanize their program and force people against um, the labor movement. So on October 1st uh, uh, of 1910, the Los Angeles Times building that I just showed you uh, at 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, a bomb went off. And the bomb was placed at a location on one side of a masonry wall, it was in an alley, and the bomb went off on the other side of that wall were some barrels of printer's ink, and uh, there was also a gas line nearby. Picture of the building. Picture of the, yeah, picture of the building, so oh, you can see. Yeah, I mean, we have some pictures down here, but essentially the bomb went off and uh, apparently the person who, set, who planted the bomb wanted to make a symbolic gesture. In other words, have a bomb go off without hurting anything, without damaging any property or whatever. This was not the intent. This was the result of uh, a mistake. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And 22 people uh, were killed and uh, it was a tremendous disaster. And it was Samuel Gompers said, this was a catastrophe for the labor movement. This was the last thing we wanted at a time when the upsurge was going on, organizing uh, labor's goodwill in Los Angeles with the chance of electing a fantastic person like Joe Harriman. This had to happen and turned everyone um, into a different direction. When this event happened, the, the response of the labor people in Los Angeles was uh, quite clear. They knew that an alternate facility had been set up to publish the very next day's LA Times, which came out that morning. It was printed in another building, the paper was there, the press was set up, the headlines came out, Unionists blow up LA Times. So in other words, you see these books that Steve hands out with our calendar for Labor Fest, that takes a lot of work. And Casby produced that, I don't know, months in advance before we can hand them out. You don't just put out something in a city of that size, a newspaper, um, where your printing plant was allegedly blown up at 1 a.m. in the morning and be on the, on the streets with your paper the next morning, something already printed. Uh, the, uh, all the executive records had been moved out. Plans were drawn up for the new building. This building was not designed to accept uh, the weights and loads and, and logistics of a printing facility. The building just was never intended that way when it was first built, so plans were made to demolish this and build a new building. Those were existing, complete plans. And uh, 
So when the local union people knew this and they went out and proved this, they called Gomp, they, however they re reached him in those days, they called Sam Gompers and through the um, uh, other people here in Cal Federation of Labor and contacted them. Um, there was also a, 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 a gas line, just like we had here in San Bruno, that was suspect. The gas line contributed to the fire. So in addition to the collapse of the building, a great fire broke out, and that's what caused most of the uh, fatalities. So it was clear to everyone, or they thought, it, was, it would be easy for them to prove that um, labor had nothing to do with this. Um, and again, uh, the, the, the Times building itself, the, uh, Sam Gompers brought in people from John L. Lewis from the United Mine Workers Union, people expert in understanding how things of this type developed. And the United Mine Workers issued a report, which I don't have in this file here, but I can get for you if you want to see it. The original report of the United Mine Workers was that this building was a disaster waiting to happen. It collapsed for uh, what they felt was a gas explosion, a ga not a bomb, but a gas explosion that ignited the printer's ink and caused the fire and caused the collapse. That was the record of the experts of the United Mine Workers. And uh, on eight, October 26th of 1910, which was about six weeks before the election, investigators for the state fed, the State Federation of Labor, was a, uh, he liked to call himself general. This was his idea of what was cool, to be General Otis. And he was the, uh, basically the leader of the open shop movement, just like Reagan or somebody like that. Somebody who's a total uh, egomaniac. And uh, he had been a printer when he was uh, younger in his age, in starting out in newspaper work. But um, anyway, he came. Did he have that kind of insurance policy after going to Burns? I'm not sure if insurance policies were that, I'm not, I don't know how far developed that was at that time. I, I'd have to look that up before I told you a truthful answer. So I, I, just, I just don't know that. Um, but he was, as I say, they were prepared to go forward in a different location. So again, just to sum up where we are, uh, the uh, Merchants and Manufacturers Association were going forward with a militant campaign to uh, stop unionism and uh, after uh, all of this support came in from all over the country, Sam Gompers uh, asked every union member in the United States to take the assignment from the head of our union. And immediately, Joe Harriman found out about this. And with everything this man had to lose, he stepped forward and volunteered and said, I will defend them. This is a false case, and I will defend them. This was a guy who was about to be elected mayor of Los Angeles. And had he been, he was a socialist candidate. Can you imagine the difference in our state if we had Joe Harriman elected at that time? And this guy was so talented and so wonderful. He could have been, he, he, instead of Woodrow Wilson and, and people like that, we could have had him as president. Anyway, um, Harriman stepped forward, but Gompers was distressed by the story. And Gompers went back to Darrow and said, look, for our public relations need, we need you to be on the case. So you can help Harriman, but we need you to be on. So Gompers persuaded Darrow to take the case. And then Darrow um, uh, went to Los Angeles and immediately started being the target of personal attacks by the, by the same people who created this whole scenario to start with. He was set up by a number of um, female, uh, <coughs> I don't know how the right way to say this and sound politically correct, but there were certain women that were assigned to him to embarrass him and disgrace him. And they were successful, very skilled women. They were successful in doing that. He was also involved with a bunch of phony charges about uh, crooked investment deals and stock market deals that had nothing to do with him. He was also charged with bribing a juror. He was charged with, with, with creating, a, a, ordering an assault on a potential witness, which is a criminal offense. And Darrow ended up with a whole series of charges, which the year after this trial ended, he had to go to court himself twice to defend himself against. And both times, they never got a, an acquittal verdict, both times he got a hung jury verdict. But this was the kind of level that, of, uh, that these people went against. So I don't want to keep you guys up all night. I'm about five more minutes here, and we'll wrap this up. As, as the events uh, 
got close to actually impaneling a jury. Uh, the, the act of impaneling a jury was, became very hard. They had thousands of people they went through before they could end up with the 12 people who were going to be on the jury. And one of the requests of the defense was that the, these brothers be tried differently. There was no way the county prosecutor could prove anything regarding this bombing against a man who was in Indianapolis and proven to be there and had no proof of any direction going from him to um, whoever laid the bomb there. There was also no way he could prove anything against the other McNamara, but Morty McManigle, the guy who worked for Burns and was part of this uh, Herbert Hawking treachery, Morty McManigle had issued a very, very long uh, confession uh, that was dictated to him by Burns. So in that case, they did have the semblance of a case, and, but they were losing massively in the court of public opinion. And this whole thing was heading toward the December 4th, 1911 election of the mayor, that, which we all felt Joe Perriman was going to win. So what happened was a, an act of, that we see all the time with people that we call the Democrats. You know, now that's what we call them. But in those days, they called them traitors. And a guy named Lincoln Steffen showed up. Did anyone ever hear this guy?